And just to kind of piggyback on what Jay was saying, Jill is phenomenal. If what, if when I'm done tonight, if you're thinking that stuff sounds like that could really work with my child or work in the program, I strongly, strongly encourage you to go to one of those because she is amazing. And it'll be fun and entertaining as well as hopefully some concrete ideas that you can, you can actually switches <laughs> That said, Jay already kind of told you a little bit about me. I am a preschool teacher with the St. Joe School District. I have been happily stuck in preschool for 22 years now. And um, I always tell my preschoolers, I haven't learned to write my name yet, so I don't get to move on to kindergarten with you. But um, it is a fun age to, to teach. I also have four boys and just to kind of touch on that a little bit, I have twin boys that are juniors in high school. They learn to share very early. They get along amazingly. There were two of them, so they had to share. I wasn't the twin mom who had two of everything. We had one of everything, and so they had to share. Then four years later, their little brother came along, Luke. He was no problem at all either. Life was still really good in my household. <laughs> And then four years later, my strong will child arrived, and things changed. You pushed it. Anybody have? I know, right? <laughs> I know. Um, so, and part of it was my fault. It was the baby, and it was like, we were busy, and it was like, just give it to him, give it to him, let him have it. And then at two, it was like, holy cow, what have I created? So, all of this kind of stuff we're going to talk about tonight really came in handy in my own classroom, as well as at home. Um, I was first exposed to the conscious discipline approach at school with preschoolers. And in those trainings, I sat there thinking, oh my gosh, this works at home, which I think is the best part about my job is because I don't know how many other jobs you can sit in training and then take it home and apply it to all of your loved ones. It works on spouses and things like that too. So, um, Okay, so that's a little bit about me. So just I just kind of want to know whom I'm talking to. So just raise your hand if you actually work in child care. Okay. What age groups do you work? I'm actually in the infant room where I've worked with okay. five years of age. Okay. And All right. Proceed. Um, I'll be with a two-year-old. That'll be my okay. So lots of strong will. Yeah. Children. And the two will be. All right. You guys. Two-year-old though. Year old. Year olds. Okay. The babies. The babies. Not yet. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Three. Two, four. Five. Okay, so, yeah, some strong little, yeah. little children in there. I'm sure faces are popping into your head when I say strong will. All right, and you folks have some children over there. And how, what are their ages? Four and a half and one and a half. Four and a half and one and a half. Okay. Either one of them fit that strong little child description? Number two. Number two, so one and a half. Yeah, all right. Two. I have a whole mess of kids, but okay. none of them are here. <laughs> okay, all right. I, uh, I have two bio kids and then two foster kids. Okay, and what other ages? Um, infant to nine. Infant to nine, okay. All right. Four classes. Okay. So we work with all ages. Just Gotcha, perfect. Okay. And we were talking, that's court appointed. Special advocates. Awesome. Yeah, that's what. We, we were over there talking, I said, oh, I know it's quarter point of seven. <laughs> <laughs> I All right, well, when you leave here tonight and it doesn't work tomorrow, you have to give it 21 days. According to brain research, it takes 21 days to develop new habits. So that is not only with our children, the I told you a million times. Well, have you told them for 21 days because it takes that long, but also, this theory and this approach that we're going to talk about tonight, if it's different than anything you've ever done, you have to give yourself a few weeks for, to really see if this could, could work because it's really going to take that long for you to do it. And every time I sit and revisit it, or I think Jill's coming to talk to the preschool teachers again this year, and I've had many conscious discipline trainings, but every time I hear it, I take away one more thing that's like, oh my gosh, I forgot that I am not being very empathetic anymore, or I'm forgetting to do this. And so... It really, truly takes 21 days to make a difference in your child. So when you're trying new things with your children, stick with it. Give it some time to make sure they have to relearn this approach. The first few times some of these things we're going to talk about, you're like, okay, that did not work at all. 
Okay, there are seven basic skills, and we're going to mostly focus on the choices, but these are the parts of conscious discipline. We've got composure, encouragement, assertiveness, choices, positive intent, empathy, and then consequences. And we're going to briefly touch on everything, but focus a little bit more on consequences. Yeah. Are these skills in our part or skills we're trying to instill? Both. Okay. Both. It's a two part thing. That's a great question. Such as composure, becoming the person you want children to be. Children learn, and you'll hear this throughout, they are going to model after what, what they see us do. STAR is something I teach my kids in my classroom, stands for smile, take a deep breath, and relax. But that's something we also can internally tell ourselves. When our child's having that power struggle or that meltdown at Walmart, or I'm having a meltdown at Walmart, I always see kids having a meltdown at Walmart, and I tell the parents, you know what, I want to act that way too here. But I can't, so it's okay. Um, but thinking STAR in your head, smile, and we smile because it immediately calms us down. You know, we're angry, we're uptight, I cannot believe he just threw that toy across the room again. We smile, we take a deep breath, and we let relax. This is one of my favorites. And I think this one you can use across the board in your life. No one can make you angry without your permission. We get upset. We get upset because the child's having a meltdown, the child didn't come to the carpet. The child took his friend's toy again. Don't let them make us angry. So we have to remember, no one can make us angry. That's giving somebody else the power over our emotions. And we don't want to do that. And out of control adults focus on what they don't want to happen. We're saying, don't touch that. Don't do that. Don't, 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 don't. And that's all the child hears. And the child will very quickly just begin doing all of those don'ts. Because why not? That's all I hear. Um, so self-control is your first priority. So composure, back to your question, kind of falls more on us as the adult. Self-talk, saying to yourself, I am safe, I am calm, I can handle this. Those are things you can also teach your child because we're going to go through some little things like that too. And when they're in a sense of craziness, telling themselves, I am safe, I am calm, I can handle this. Or a younger child with a baby, I can handle this. I got this. But just that self-talk, making sure we're composed before we go in to handle those heated battles. Encouragement is another big one. And basically, I think it all kind of sums up in focus on the child's efforts and their small steps they take, not only on the touchdown. You want them to be here in their behavior or here in anything, but don't wait till they get there to tell them, you did it. You know, focus on the little things that it takes to get there. You know, when you're watching them at the game, you don't know, wait until they score the touchdown to celebrate. You're celebrating every first down, every every play. It's kind of like that with our kids, too. Assertiveness is the next one on that step. What you focus on, you get more of. I used to have a sign in my classroom that said that it suddenly got so embedded into my brain. But And that's back to that don't, 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 don't. Don't focus on that. Focus on the positive behavior. Um, I am only on week two with my students, but I have a little guy who's kind of challenging. And I'm really trying to, A, build that relationship with him so he cares what I think, but also catching him every time he's doing something right. No matter how little this, you are on the carpet right now. Thank you so much. That's really helpful. And so focusing on those things, not the 25 times today that he was not on the carpet, but trying to focus on that one time he was. Because the more we focus on that, kids and people in general want, want that feedback. And if they're getting positive feedback, they're going to continue to do the positive things. If they're getting negative feedback, that's what you're going to get. So focusing on those positive things. Um, you know, it's the same way how with my teenage boys. You know, it doesn't matter if they're one or two or 17. Um, asking yourself, what can I do to help this child successfully meet both my expectations and his needs at the same time? You know, I expect him to sit in the grocery cart when we're at Walmart. Or I expect him to sit on the carpet for circle time. He needs to be constantly moving. So instead of yelling at him constantly, you need to sit still. You need to, you know, don't touch that, don't touch that. What can I do to help his needs be met and what I need from him? You know, maybe it's I give him a fidget toy so he can be moving 
He's still safe on the car. He's still safe on the carpet, but he's got a fidget toy. Um, the I statements are really, really big, and I'm sure you'll hear Jill talk about this too if you get the chance to see her. Um, instead of saying "don't," I don't like it when you hit me. When you run through the house, which <laughs> that's my kids right now. We downsized the summer, so now we're all right on top of each other, and it's really, really hard. And the running and the noise is really horrible. And I yell at them constantly, stop running in the house, you can't do that. And when I was working on this, I thought, oh, that's really a better way for me to tell them that. They could probably really respond to that. When you run through the house, I feel distracted and I can't think. Please don't run through the house. Instead of saying, stop it, you're running through the house, I'm turning it on me. And that's also teaching them to care what other people think and be considerate of other people. Just these are the rules and you're not following them. I don't like it when you interrupt. I can't remember what I was saying. Please, please be patient. As opposed to, stop. Quit. Uh, quit. It's not your turn to tap. No, it's not. We use the words in preschool a lot too. Your steps. You're stepping on my words, or you're stepping on Joe's words. Those are really, really. On a side note, <laughs> for interrupting, those are great, great things. And I hear, I hear the kids in my classroom continually say that to, to other kids. He's stepping on my words, Miss Becky. Yeah, he has. So, and that, I don't know why, but that little verbiage just works really amazing. Um, when your toys are left on the floor, I feel scared because someone might trip and hurt themselves. Please pick up the toys and put them on the shelf. How much more empowering is that to a child than, you left your Legos on again? <laughs> you know, I, I feel scared. So you're turning it on you, not on the child. And then we get two toys. So the reason for choices is to empower the children. Children want to be in control. We know we really need to be in control, so the whole point here is letting them be in control of things that don't really matter. Giving them some choices so they feel they're in control, and then hopefully when you need to say, this is what we're doing here, they'll be more likely to comply because they've had all these choices. Their bank is full because they've had all these choices. Um, an example I always give to families is, you know, choosing their clothes, choosing their clothes for school with preschool kids. You know, for a lot of parents, that's a huge battle because they want them to look nice and proper everywhere they go. So picture day is an important day to look nice and proper. If you've given them the choices on the other days that really don't matter in preschool, it really doesn't. I always commend a little child when they come in, you clearly know that they've dressed themselves that day. You know, and I make comments, wow, your outfit is so cool today. Because I want parents to know that it doesn't really matter. And why go through that battle that morning? Because she wanted to wear her pink skirt with her zebra pants and her orange polka dot shirt. It really doesn't matter. But if you've given them those choices, Monday through Thursday and Friday is picture day, you're going to have a lot more success that Friday they're going to wear what you want them to wear because you've already filled their bank with all of those, those choices. And maybe leading up to that in those situations, you know, well, you get to choose what you want to wear today, but tomorrow we're going to grandma's birthday, so I really need you to wear this. But what did you want to wear today? And so things like that, too. Just if you build up those banks, then you can, that will help them get to choose when you have that power when it's your turn to choose. Um, so we're going to skip that second bullet for just a minute. A positive and a negative option is not really a choice, but a manipulation. Do you want to go to time out? Or do you want to sit here and listen to my story? That's not a choice. <laughs> that's, that's manipulating the child. And it's probably not going to get you anywhere. Um, an example with a toddler would be that the toddler, you know, really wants juice, but it's milk time, and the child's getting milk. So you can't give them the choice. Do you want apple juice or do you want milk? Because you need them to have milk. But you can give them the choice. Do you want the red cup or the blue cup? So you don't care if they drink out of the red cup or the blue cup. But to a small child, I suddenly got a choice, and now I'm in charge, and I'm in control. They don't really understand that it really doesn't matter. They got to make a choice, and then you can pour that milk in that blue cup, and hopefully there's a less likely for a power struggle than if you just said, here's your milk in the blue cup. It sounds silly, but it's, it's really kind of crazy. Another choice is brushing your teeth. If brushing your teeth is a battle, do you want to brush your teeth before your bath or after your bath? Suddenly so the kids are like, oh, well, I'm going to do it after I'm done. Okay, great. Works for me. Sounds good. And so you've just given them those little, those little tiny choices where, A, remember, each choice has to be one you're okay with. 
but it, it has to be not a, manip not a manipulation either. Um, a power struggle always requires two willing participants. So if the child is, if you're getting into a power struggle with the child, it's because you willingly got into that power struggle with the child. So, for instance, with the choices, um, do you want the blue cup or the red cup? And the child's, or let's do preschool instead. Let's do um, blocks, and it's clean up time. It's clean up time. My most compliant children suddenly become non-compliant at clean up time occasionally. So the block area is a mess, and this kid is not wanting to clean up. So do you want to put away the square blocks or the rectangle blocks? The child's like, I'm not putting up any. And so then that's when I call it the broken record. I think that consciousness would cause it parroting back to them. But I think of it as a broken record. You calmly, remember? Smile, take a deep breath and relax. You calmly say it again. Do you want to put away the rectangle blocks or the square blocks? I need you to help me clean up. We've got to get our room clean today. I'm not picking up either. Again, you're not going to get into that power struggle. You're just going to throw it back out in the same thing. Then what do you do if they don't comply? Then, you know what, I, we, you, know, you, had, you had a minute to choose, and you, you didn't have a choice yet, so I'm going to have to make that choice for you now. You're going to pick up the rectangle box, or, the, or you're going to have the red cup, or whatever. So if they don't choose, then you make the choice for them. But it's not, you didn't make a choice, so now you pick them all up. You're going to you pick them all up? Yeah. I'm going to stand here and watch. Um, it's not. You still have to remain calm, remain composed, and it's still not a threatful situation. You just then you make that decision for them. But <coughs> excuse me. Sometimes you do that, and then they won't. They sit there and cry. Right. They cry. Right. What and I want to do is just I'll do it, and pretty soon they wake up. Right. Yes. yes. Well, yes. Yeah, they, or they you can leave it to them for later. You, sometimes I've done that in my classroom. Well. Those rect we're going to pick up all the rectangle blocks because you chose the square blocks, or I helped you choose the square blocks, so they're going to be here later for you. Oh, and sure. then, you know, we go on and we just put those aside for them to, to come back to later. Um, but just it, never at any point can it be threatful with your choices or any kind of demeaning with it. Um, so your question while you're trying to do this is, instead of thinking, how can I get the child to pick up the blocks? Your question, your mindset is, how do I help the child be more likely to choose to pick up the blocks? And sometimes that has to come about beforehand or after a situation. Then you reflect on it and think, okay, how could I handle that differently next time? How can I help my child be more likely to choose block? We'll come back to that. And then along with that, you have your positive intent. You always want to see the best in others. <coughs> that we, we need to reflect that way. That the, the child is not trying to purposely make our Monday horrible. We're not trying to make our trip to Walmart horrible. Um, when I was full day at preschool, it was we're not trying to make the outcome horrible for everybody else. Um, so some words that you can use with that. You wanted the blue block. So you hit them. You didn't know how to get the blue block without being hurtful. You may not hit, hitting hurts. When you want the blue block, saying, I want the blue block. And then having them try that. Um, and again, that whole thing right there takes you back to that whole 21 days to create a new mindset. That if you've never used those kind of words with your student or with your child at home um, or whomever, they're, it's not going to happen the first time. They're probably going to look at you like, hello, what? I want the blue block and I'm still going to hit. And so it takes a while to, to, for them to learn that. Um, and the next part here is a biggie. And I think this is really, really super, super important. And it's really hard. It's very simple, but it's really hard. Praise the child when they complied, even when it took longer than you wanted it to. Take bedtime at home. At my house, bedtime has always been the most challenging. I think it's because I'm the tiredest at that point and I'm worn out, and I really need some mom time, and I really need you to go to bed. Um, so let's take bedtime for home. So bedtime took a really, really long time. It was a battle to brush those teeth. It was a battle to do all of it. 
Finally, the child comes out and they've got their jammies that you sent them to get with them kicking and screaming five minutes ago. They finally come out and they're dressed and they're ready for bed. At that point, I'm well, it took you long enough. That is not okay. <laughs> that is not what we want. What we want is, wow, you're ready for bed. I am ready for your story now. That was so helpful that you got your jammies on. And you have to, rem- you have to leave that sarcastic voice that I really, really have back in the way back part of your head. <laughs> you can hear it in your inner talk if that helps you, but you can't convey that to the child because you really need to sound genuine. Because they're like, oh, look at that. I got my jammies on and dad's really pleased with me. <coughs> That's pretty cool. It's the same thing at circle time or in th- times like that in the classroom or picking up. You know, that child that left those blocks and was mel- having a meltdown and you went on about your day, the child finally, you know, begrudgingly goes over and picking them up, putting them away, because by golly, snack's coming, and he knows it. And he knows these blocks have to be put away so he can join you at the snack table. And then when he does that, you acknowledge it. You say, hey, Tim, can you put those square blocks right where they went? Way to go. Even though in your mind you're thinking, I cannot believe it took him 15 minutes to pick up those three blocks. But we notice it. We notice it, and that's, that's really huge, and that's a big part of it, and that's really hard, because you don't want to, <laughs> you don't want to, you know, it's like, dang it, you should have picked them up 20 minutes ago, but, but when we notice those kinds of things, and we praise them for that, then, like we talked at the beginning, kids want that feedback, and when they get it, when they do well, even when it took them 20 minutes to get to that point, hopefully, in that 21 day period, then they'll be more likely to, to continue to do it because they know they're going to get those, those positive words. And we all want those positive words, whether it's at, with a spouse, at home, at our, at our work. We all want to hear that, even as adults. And so I think that's pretty powerful for kids to, you know, I see kids really light up when they do that, as opposed to the opposite. If you almost scold them again, then they're going to be come to your snack table right back where they were at that meltdown in the box. Whereas if you praise them, they're going to come to the table thinking, look at me. I picked up the square blocks, Joe. (laughs) (coughs) Empathy. Empathy is big. It's hard. It's one of our, on our curriculum goals in preschool. It's a hard thing for for, for nine-year-olds to have. It's it almost it really has to be learned, and they kids learn empathy from it being modeled to them. They really do. They see how we react when they're upset, and that teaches them how to react when someone else is upset. Um, and in the, in my classroom, it's it's really obvious. Like you see kids that come in, and they just automatically have that. And I'm pretty sure it's probably because they they've just seen that. They've seen that versus kids who have a really hard time with it. You know, and it's not no fault of parenting. It's just that maybe it has, they've not really witnessed it that much. Um, so I think that's a really big deal for us as parents and as educators to remember how to respond to that. Wow, you know. Even, even empathy when they're upset about something that they shouldn't be upset about. It's not just empathy because they come in and tell you that their pet died. That's pretty easy to be empathetic about. I mean, we feel bad for the child. But even when they're like, Miss Jill, you gave me the circle cookie. And he got the square, and I really wanted the square cookie today. And you're thinking in your head, it's a cookie. It's the same cookie. It's just a different shape. You're like, so I'm happy to be empathetic there. That is really sad. One of the consciousness of the catchphrases is, what about her? But you got to say it empathetically, not sarcastically. You know, oh, what a bummer. You really wanted that square cookie today, didn't you? Gosh, that would make me sad too. Yes! Yeah. <laughs> uh, you're right. And, you know, it, it doesn't really matter, but you're modeling that empathy to them when they're upset over nothing, which children get upset over nothing, but reflect upon yourself. I know there are a lot of times I get upset over nothing. Or upset over things that, that I hear people that are dealing with much, much, much worse things than I'm dealing with that I think really what I was upset about was nothing. I mean, whether it's my lost PowerPoint or my air conditioning network in my car, there are people today that are dealing with things much worse. And so 
teaching a child empathy is, is a big deal. And you can teach it to them over something that when they're upset over nothing, you know. Maybe they're upset because their little brother touched him in the car. I mean, can you believe he would even do that? That's horrible. And so us responding with empathy is helping them learn to grow up and be empathetic toddlers, empathetic preschoolers, empathetic school-agers, empathetic adults. And I just love the picture of that little girl. Oh, yes. <laughs> she's, not, she's not happy about getting that circle cookie. So what about the teenagers? <laughs> what a bummer that I just took your phone. You know, and jumping ahead, but consequences is on there, and I know that that's one of, I think, is that what Jill's speaking that's about? the main focus of the Is the consequences. Um, mm-hmm. And she'll talk about appropriate consequences and making it a mesh. The crime, and like my teenage boys are really bad, they're driving now, and they're really, really bad about communicating with me. They think they can just go wherever, and they show up at bedtime, and I shouldn't have a problem with that. Like, you have to tell me where you're going. Better ask for permission, but I need to at least, at the very least, know where you're going, and they just don't get that. And then, like, the other day, I said, you know, if if you're not able to tell me when you make it to the game tonight, you, you won't need your phone tomorrow. They're like, what? I'm like, well... Clearly, don't need it. You're not texting me to let me know, so you clearly don't need your phone. So that's an appropriate consequence for that. You know, I'm not going to take away something. You know, their Xbox because that really doesn't match the crime. They're not able to communicate with me. They don't need their phone. They don't use. Obviously, it's not working. I should probably take it back to AT and T and find out why it's not working, right? Um, and I think consequences is always the thing that I. That's the, my biggest struggle mm-hmm. with it all. I never can find the appropriate thing. Yeah. It matches the crime. Because I have the problem of getting too upset by the time I have that problem. So I'm like, I'm going to lock you in your room for days and <laughs> break all your stuff. And, you know, <laughs> you know, and it's like, you know, yeah, right. I always need to like separate myself and go actually think, like, okay, that might be okay. You know? Right, exactly. No, I think, I think, and I think it's okay. To not give the consequence right then too. So you have to, you know what? Dad's really upset right now. Can't believe that you just, you know, put the Legos in the toilet. So I'm gonna go think for a little bit and we'll come back later tonight and we'll talk about that because it is hard. And I'm the same way, like you just wanna immediately go to your room. No TV tonight. But um, I thought they said that it should be right away so that they associate Well, I Well, and I think it depends on the age. His son is a kindergartner, so he's probably able to have a little bit of that delay. But obviously, definitely with, you know, in four and under, um, four is kind of pushing it. You can, depending upon the child, you know, I could do some delayed stuff at school, depending on the child. Some kids would need that immediate. But, um, but I think making sure you're calm would be more important. If you're not calm yet, yeah. then let the, it, would be more, it would be better to let the consequence wait. In practice, your brain takes 21 days too. Yes, so exactly. You yeah. practice and do it, you kind of start getting your arsenal ready. Yes. And, you know, and Sometimes I can think of more. Yeah. Yeah. And for me, I think just thinking through, whether it's at home or school, thinking through those repeat offenses that happen a lot, and thinking through, okay, well, when they do this, what would be? The logical consequence. What matches that? You know, with my 12-year-old, I automatically just want to take away any gaming system because that's his heart and soul. But did that really match? Was he is he in trouble because he's ignoring me or didn't get his homework done because he's playing on it? Then yes, that matches the crime. But you know, if it's something crazy that he you know was mean to his little brother, that might not necessarily match the crime. I might want to instead make him have some quality time with his little brother playing the game. Or let you have the little brother playing the game. Yeah, exactly. And so. I think one thing to remember is, you know, I deal with this in my job as well. Their, their perception is their reality, no matter whether it's right or wrong. Right. It's it's real to them. If they're upset about something. It's, it's real to right. them, no matter how trivial it is. To exactly. Them. Yeah. Exactly. For sure. Uh, I had a little guy a couple years ago with the, the cracker thing. Anytime we served pretzels for snack, it's like the world was ending. That was just horrible. You know, and being empathetic with that it was the best way to handle it. Because, you know, so, it's, I know we've got pretzels again. I know you hate pretzels. I'm really sorry. I'm hoping tomorrow will be a yummier snack for you. Versus, you know what? Get back in that chair. It's, you know, you don't have to eat it, but just that, that empathy can be so big. Here's some examples, and they're on your handout, too, because I like the wordage on these. Um, 
a child who maybe is always pushing off, you know, those empathy, you'll figure out a way to be helpful. I know you. Inside, you don't like to be hurtful. And I know you're going to figure this out. Those sorts of things can't happen, right, when, it's, when things are happening because the part of the brain that the child is in, they're not ready to hear that kind of stuff. So those kinds of things have to happen later. Even with my older kids, you know, those kinds of things have to happen later. They can't happen right away. Um, that's a rough spot you're in. I know you can work it out. Let me know if you need any help. We all make mistakes. What can you do now that would be helpful? And those are things you can kind of talk about later. Remember when we were at Walmart and you had that meltdown? I know you don't want to. You know, I know you don't like Walmart, but I know I know you don't like it when you can't get the toys. So what can we do next time? You know, and maybe come up with a plan. Well, I'm gonna use mom's phone and I'm gonna take pictures of all the things at Walmart I wish I could buy. You know? Something like that. So those kinds of things can help being proactive for the next time too. Um, consequences that we kind of talked about that, we're just touching briefly because I know Jill's gonna hit that hard, but mistakes are opportunities for children to learn. So even those crazy things, there if you think of it and you have oh, here's a chance I get to teach them something. You know? And not I'm gonna teach that, they can't do it, they're going to the room. But just really like the, the little girl drawing on the wall. What's the obvious consequence? No crayons. Maybe you don't get to use crayons. They have to uh, wash the wall. Wash the wall. I had a little guy today at writing time. He didn't think his paper was very cool, and he thought my table was. And every day I'm like, well, it makes me sad that she marked on a table. I hope that shirt comes off. When we're, everybody else is done, you can stay over here and get it cleaned up. And part of that I'm thinking in my head, is that really a consequence? Because he's probably thinking my wet wipe is really cool. <laughs> you know? But I had to take a step back and ignore that fact and realize he's learned if I write on the table, I have to wipe it off. He may do it two more times because it was really cool, but by then the newness will have worn off and it won't be so cool, and hopefully he'll remember the papers are for writing on that table. So yeah, having that little girl clean it up. The magic erasers are super for kids. They, they can clean it about anything up like that. Um, all right, and that's it. The last slide that you have on there just gives some resources and things um, of where a lot of this comes from that you can do. The Conscious Discipline website is really great. Um, those of you that are in classrooms, it has some really great things that you can download, um, signs and, and uh, things that you can use in safe spots and things like that too with the kids. But anybody have any specific questions, general questions about situations yet? Yeah. yeah our board have uh, you go to this mega ninjas thing where they go out on the gym floor and jump. And uh -huh. the yes. And so we get to watch him misbehave or someone else. <laughs> and it seems like one of the standards is they'll be trying something new and he deliberately does it wrong and just falls down. Mm -hmm. and, and he gets frustrated and comes crying like, I couldn't do it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. And, I, I, and I, I was watching him just, just today because we came here from there. And it really seems like he's, he's doing it for attention. Right. Because then Mr. Matthew has to come over and help him sure. do what he's doing. Right. But of course, he's halfway across the field. We're watching the other one. I don't know. How do you address this after the fact? You, we ask them, you know, why are you doing these things that I don't know? Right, and what that's, there's two things popped in my mind. The one that you said that he may be doing it because then he's going to get some special amount of attention. And he may also be doing it because he truly thinks at the beginning, this is new, I don't really know, this is something I haven't done before. So if I just deliberately do it wrong, I'm deliberately doing wrong and I'm not really messing up. That's what, what I that's, That was your thought. Just I think it could be either way. Yeah. So I'm thinking, you know, as as the teacher, and I don't know if you could tell you know, maybe he could have, if he could have your son model the activity, you know, so he's getting that attention there too, and maybe he gets to help model the new, the new activity or whatever they were doing, and kind of take a leadership role of that. He might you know, step up to the plate for that versus feeling like I'm just going to mess it up because I don't really know what I quite know what I'm supposed to do. He does create pretty well when he asks, "Can you show your your little mm -hmm. show Nicholas how to yeah. do this?" Yeah. Yeah, so I'm thinking, yeah, maybe he could, and I don't know what your, you know, the relationship is with the teacher, but I would think that would definitely be something to say, you know, hey, we've noticed this, is there any way, you know, every once in a while, or just to see if that made any kind of difference for him to be the one to to get that attention positively and not have to get it after the fact. It does seem like the kids naturally want to help. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. You just need to give them the opportunity. Very much so. Very I, much yeah, so. and I would talk to the teacher, and I don't know how much of it's going to roll over into their classes like the ninjas. Mm -hmm. But Mega is getting ready to open 
a preschool. Mm -hmm. they're, they're sure. yeah. right. And I don't know if I don't know who's going to be the teachers of that. Sure. Or if those teachers are also, I mean, I don't know how any of that's going to work for them. But you might want to say something because it might be something he could even go to and say where you guys might, you know, be able to kind of get a little huddle there and say, we really need him to do it right the first time. Or at least give a better shot, you know, and, and figure it out what might be better for him. You know, so, I mean, I kind of agree with letting him be the, the role model for whatever exercise he's doing. My son does and he has Justin. And Justin promotes hyperactivity. So I never say anything to my son when he's crazy because the teacher <laughs> promotes the crazy. You know? <laughs> it's like, I don't know about Matthew, but it's like, yeah, I always sit there watching going, oh my gosh, but it's hard to say anything. Yeah. Yeah. Some, some sort of example of that. Yeah. I think that's just a defense mechanism that like kids get. I see that. Plus, we do have a little guy who, for whatever reason, you know, he's a very active little boy, but he does not want to jump. If we're doing a game where we're jumping and like all eyes might be on him for jumping, he does not want, you know, to play any part in it. And I think that it's it's just for whatever reason he's intimidated to jump right now or something. So I think kids will shut down, and then he acts goofy or flops on the floor or stuff just because he doesn't feel comfortable doing this one skill. So. <laughs> yeah. And I think too, just, and I don't know how immediate it can be with where you're located, Megan, but when you notice he does do a skill right, you know, if there's some way to immediately yeah, put it all the way on the other side. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Or, you know, or tell him ahead of time, you know, because um, just all I got the encouragement that, hey, mom and dad have been watching, look over us occasionally, we're, you know, we're, we'll give you that thumbs up when we see you doing something great. And so, and giving him an example of like, when you're learning something new, you try real hard, you know, look over at us and we'll be giving you the thumbs up. So he's getting some positive feedback and maybe then won't need that other feedback that he's getting. We try to get it after the fact. We're like, well, I saw you do this. Yeah, that was amazing. Yeah. Yes. What, what do you guys do while he's back there? Even well, I know it's, 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 <laughs> the well, it's hard to see. Yeah, yeah. It's hard to see because I've been there yeah. too. And they used to have that you're right on top of the child. You can just cut it. And I think that's why they made it. Mm -hmm. I think they had problems with children interact too much with yeah, their parents. Right. I'm usually taking a one and a half. Who <laughs> wants to be out there joining with brothers? Yeah. Well, and, sure. and sometimes that can be a little too what the child sees where I always use the instance of like swim lessons where a kid's like on the diving board, you know, and scared to do it. And he's like, dad, 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 you know, and the dad's just sitting there and like, yeah, you know, and the kid finally does it and the dad just, yeah, good job, you know, pays no attention. Not that you're not paying attention, but if your mind's with the other child who's running around and every time he does do something he looks over and mom's not look he doesn't know what you're doing you might totally be paying attention to him but if you're not if he don't see your eyes and a smile or a thumbs up he might think there's no attention there this is the classic so thing, he's going to say dad 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 until I acknowledge him yeah right at him yeah you got to be you know so it right might even be a thing to where you know the focus just needs to be you know and I know that's hard when you get another child running all over the place and he yeah. doesn't understand you've got that mom yeah. sense where you can still run after and still yeah. know what's going on. Yeah, he doesn't get that. He has so, not learned yeah. that you were doing that. But He'll, that focus yeah, is important. Yeah, exactly. Because that's kind of given the empathy and everything there when you just look there, kind of like we said at the beginning that, you know, for the small steps. Just mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's really I would really encourage you to, to listen to Jill when she's in town. She's amazing. I'm trying to Karen, Karen, Karen Hickman is the other who's came before, and she's yeah. Uh, they're both. So we so we just have the two boys, do you, and you've got four across a wider age. Should they get easier as they get older, or do they get worse as they get older? I think it's easier. You know. That's what we've heard. You know, like girls are easy in the uh -huh. beginning; they get worse yes. in the teenage years. The yes. Boys are hard in the beginning, then yeah. they just grunt and go to their room. Exactly. Do they have to be quiet? They smell yeah. that sometimes. Why? They have to be quiet. Yeah. 
Yes. Boys are noise. Boys are loud. Language. In my classroom at school this year, I have four girls and nine boys in one of my rooms. And I'm like, it's just it's just a noisy group. It's not that boys are bad and girls are good. Boys are just louder. They just in general are louder. But there's no drama. Right? <laughs> yeah, boys are no drama. Yeah, right. right. I remember when my boys were about. I'm having a bad day, Mom. That was today <laughs> in the car. I remember. I guess the drama was different. Like the boys, my boys were like fifth grade, and they had an incident on the playground at school with football, and a, you know, whole meltdown with the other boys and stuff. I thought, the benefit of this is that tomorrow they'll all be friends again. This was girls we've been hearing about it for weeks. <laughs> and it was. They were fine the next day. So I think that's the the blessing of this. Dad and boys love their moms. It's a really cool thing. <laughs> do you say that? Do you say yeah? They do. Yeah, they do. No, they weren't for daddy. They do. The daddy's not the daddy's out of the household anymore. Yeah. Daddy's the new like the new face. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Girl. Yeah. Mommy's too big. Big cousin. I said if I had had a girl, she would have been a little tall girl. She wouldn't have been a a princess, but you know, four older brothers, she wouldn't have had a chance. So that's all him. I'm constantly trying to steal some of my students in school now. <laughs> I tell parents that at orientation, and I'm like, you know, I have boys, I know boys, I'm going to understand your son, I'm going to love your son, and if you have a daughter, don't worry, I'm probably going to try to steal her and take her home with me at some point, because I will the boys home. That's what makes the world go around, right? They're all so unique and different, yeah. even at a very on, on the age. 